There are certain events that have such significance that they are referred to as turning points of history. The life of Martin Luther would have such significance that it deserves to be thus classified. But sometimes big things come in small packages and sometimes major world events have humble beginnings. On the 10th of November, 1483, in the little town of Eisleben, Saxony, Germany, Martin Luther was born here in this house. As with the early apostles, Luther did not come from the wealthy, well-to-do classes, but from the ranks of poverty. Here in his home, we can see evidence of his family's humble beginnings. They were poor, but honest, industrious, and never dreamt that their son would grow up to become a famous figure in the history of the world. His father was a miner, working long hours to provide the means for Luther's education, hoping that he would one day become a lawyer. In spite of his father's hard work, the family was so poor that Luther would sometimes have to sing from door to door on the way to school in order to obtain food. As well as being the town that Luther was born in, Eisleben is also the town where Luther was baptized, here in the church of St. Peter and Paul. It's also the town where he preached his last sermon in the church of St. Andrew. And it's here in this town where he lived before passing away. Martin Luther enrolled in the University of Erfurt right here in the building behind me and diligently applied himself to his study. One day, he was in the university library and found a copy of the Latin Bible. He had never seen a Bible before, being ignorant of its very existence. He had heard portions read in worship, but had never seen the whole Bible. And now, for the first time in his life, he gazed upon it as a whole. Luther graduated with a BA in 1502, and three years later, in 1505, he attended this Augustinian monastery. His father was very disappointed in him, and this put strain on their relationship, and it was two years before father and son would be reconciled to each other again. It was an earnest desire to be free from sin and to find peace with God that led Luther to seek the monastic life. While here in the monastery, he would often spend time reading and studying God's Word. He had found a Bible chained to the convent wall, and it was to there that he would often spend time. Luther was a very pious monk, and if salvation could be obtained through his works, then he would most certainly have been entitled to it. Luther was the type of person that would have killed himself through fast, penances and abstinences had the gospel not been brought to his understanding. God brought a friend and helper in a man named Staupitz. He was a professor of religion at the University of Wittenberg and was the vicar general of the monastic order to which Luther belonged. Their history was a very long one, but the most important thing about their relationship was that Staupitz soon realized that Luther, in his desire to serve God fully, was not truly living a gospel-centered life. God used this faithful friend to set him on the right course with a clearer understanding of the gospel. From this part of Luther's life, we learn the importance of a spiritual mentor in someone else's life. If you are an older believer, then become a spiritual mentor in someone else's life. Take the time out intentionally to mentor someone else in, for you never know the impact of that work. Jesus mentored in 12 disciples and they changed the world. May we do likewise.
After leaving the monastery, Luther was called to the University of Wittenberg to teach. While here in Wittenberg, he applied himself to the study of the scriptures in their original tongues and began to lecture on the Bible, in particular, the Psalms, the Epistles and the Gospels. His friend Staupitz urged him to ascend the pulpit and preach. This was something he was hesitant to do, feeling unworthy of the task. But following a long struggle and with encouragement from his friends, he finally agreed. Luther was an eloquent speaker, captivating his hearers with the clarity and power with which he spoke. Before long, his fame as a speaker was growing, both amongst the university students and the general public. Every great revival in history has been founded on great preaching, and the German Reformation was to be no different. A dispute arose between seven of the local convents and their vicar general, and it wasn't long before the future reformer was sent on his way to Rome to settle the quarrel. On his way there, he noticed some things. Staying at the monasteries, he noted the wealth, magnificence, and sheer luxury that was there. He contrasted this with the life of self-denial that he himself had grown accustomed to living. The Pope at that time was Pope Julius II, and Luther thought that Rome was, as it were, the very gate of heaven itself. Indeed, as he approached Rome, he lay prostrate on the ground and said, Holy Rome, I salute thee. As he entered the city and visited the churches and saw the priests and monks, he was filled with both shock and horror. He saw amongst the clergy unashamed and open sin. He heard the indecent jokes, swearing, and he struggled to find some peace and solace. No one can imagine, he said, what type of sins are committed in Rome. They have to be seen or heard to be believed. They are in the habit of saying, if there is a hell, then Rome is built over it. It is an abyss whence issues every kind of sin. By a recent decree, an indulgence was promised to all those who would ascend Pilate's staircase on their knees. It was believed that the staircase in Rome was mysteriously transported there during the night and was the very staircase that Jesus ascended on the night when he was condemned. One day, Luther was devoutly climbing these steps when a voice came to him like thunder, the just shall live by faith. He got up from his knees, walked away, never to be the same again. Upon returning from Rome, Luther preached his famous sermon entitled, The Just Shall Live by Faith, here in the St. Mary's Town Church. This was a question that lay heavy on Luther's mind and one which he wrestled with over and over again. Indeed, the German Reformation hinged on the question, how can a man be just in the sight of God? It's a question that many people still wrestle with today. At this point in his life, Luther had no plans to start his own church or movement and still saw himself as a loyal son of the church. But in making the commitment to put the Bible above the words of the councils or popes, he set himself on a course that would ultimately lead far away from Rome. In Luther's life, he followed the Holy Spirit's leading when he made the decision to preach. He followed the Holy Spirit's leading when he got off his knees in Rome. He followed the Holy Spirit's leading in his ministry here and was true to his convictions. May we be true to the Holy Spirit's leading in our life. May we be strong in our convictions and true to God's word as well.
around the same time that Luther was born in a miner's cabin up in Germany, Zwingli was born here in Switzerland in a herdsman cottage high up in the Alps. You see, the leading reformers of that time were men of humble rank, who most of all were free from pride of rank and from the influence of bigotry and priesthood. His father desired for him an education, and at the age of 13, he was sent to the city of Bern to receive one. But whilst he was there, another danger would arise. Because of his intellect, his sharp mind, and his leadership qualities, the monks desired to recruit him. While Luther had gone down that path, he had no desire to go down that path. Neither did his father, and so his father called for him to return home. Zwingli started his ministry in Basel and was ministering around the same time as Luther was, though they were not in communication with each other. God was using each of them individually. If Luther preaches Christ, said the Swiss reformer, he does what I am doing. Those whom he has brought to Christ are more numerous than those whom I have led. But this matters not. I bear no other name than that of Christ, whose soldier I am, and who alone is my chief. Never has one single word been written by me to Luther, nor by Luther to me. And why? That it might be shown how much the Spirit of God is in unison with itself, since both of us, without any collusion, teach the doctrine of Christ with such uniformity. Zwingli was soon called to minister here in Zurich at the cathedral, where he faithfully preached God's word, repelled the sale of indulgences, and spearheaded the Swiss Reformation in the early 16th century. The Church of Rome made several attempts to either end his life or oppose his teachings. When hearing of one particular plot, he replied, let them come on. I fear them as a beetling cliff fears the waves that thunder at its feet. Realizing how little had been gained by trying to suppress Luther's teachings over in Germany, they endeavored to enter into a disputation with Zwingli. The Council of Zurich, though, forbade him to go. And so instead, two of his students went in his place. There they met a host of prelates, doctors, and the champion of Rome, Dr. Eck. Each night, though, Zwingli's students would sneak letters from the city out. And then at night, Zwingli would write letters that would be snuck back into the city. And though he wasn't there, he was able to direct the proceedings that took place. He famously said during that trial, custom has no force in our Switzerland unless it be according to the constitution. Now in matters of faith, the Bible is our constitution. The contrast between the two sides made a clear impression on those who were watching at the time. Zwingli continued to faithfully preach God's word here in Zurich, Switzerland, throughout the rest of his life. God had chosen a humble man from humble origins to begin what would be a great work here in Switzerland. No matter who you are or where you come from, know that God is able to do great things through you. Whether your beginnings in life have been humble and modest, know God is able to use you mightily. Whether you are educated or uneducated, know that God is able to use you. Here in Switzerland, Zwingli was a man of very humble background, being born in a herdsman cottage up in the Alps, and yet he was used to start a mighty work of reformation here in Switzerland. In 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9, the Bible says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God specializes in doing great things through the weakest vessels.
1512 to 1517, Martin Luther's life had been engaged mainly in preaching and teaching, but it was destined to change forever when John Tetzel came to town. The Pope at that time was Pope Leo X, as Pope Julius II had died about four years previous. He was eager to proceed with the erection of the great church of St. Peter, which his predecessor had left unfinished. In order to raise funds to complete the church, rigorous methods of fundraising needed to be resorted to, and so the Pope issued indulgences with that in mind. He decided not to resort to this tactic in Spain, France, and England, but in Germany, the responsibility for selling the indulgences was given to a salesman by the name of Tetzel. As Tetzel came into a town, a messenger would go before him proclaiming the grace of God and of the Holy Father is at your gates. People welcomed this false preacher as he proposed a rather easy way to paradise. He promised to pardon all the sins which the purchaser would commit from here on out and that not even repentance was necessary. In addition to this, he promised that the indulgences had the power to forgive not only the living, but also the dead as well. Tetzel's famous quote was, as soon as the money clinks against the bottom of the chest, the soul escapes purgatory and flies to heaven. These type of messages produced two responses. Firstly, a band of scoffers who wondered why, if the Pope had the power to release people from purgatory, he didn't do it as a matter of charity. And secondly, a stronger and deeper opposition was people who asked what the Bible said about forgiveness. Luther was, at this time, still a priest of the church and still had to hear people's confessions. A problem arose when some of his parishioners produced Tetzel's pardon for their sins and Luther refused to accept them, declaring them nothing but a big fraud. Around this time also, Luther preached a powerful sermon entitled Indulgences and the Grace of God, and he also sent a detailed protest to the Archbishop and local bishop. It was amidst these events that on the festival of all saints, Luther posted on the university church door, right here behind me, his 95 theses or doctrinal statements about this debated question. This event was a turning point and the publication of the 95 theses created a great deal of excitement amongst the German people. They were read and reread and repeated far and wide. Luther was in awe at what he had done, opposed the mightiest power on earth, and it was not long before he was summoned by Rome to appear to answer for his teachings. Never before had one man who had such a huge following of people already opposed Rome on his own. At this time, the people were sick of the corruption of the church and many people were thankful that someone was saying something about it, though not everyone was bold enough to take a stand with him at the time. Let us never underestimate the power of remaining true to God's word and to our convictions. While Luther didn't understand the whole Bible or understand even the whole gospel, he did share and stay true to what he did know. He had accepted the principle that the Bible should be the sole interpreter of faith. And this one principle would light a spark that would eventually go around the whole world and lie at the foundation of Protestantism, that the Bible is to be the interpreter of our faith. May we be true to God's word and faithful in sharing the message God has given to us wherever in the world that we are.
Soon after he posted his 95 Theses in Wittenberg, Luther was summoned to appear in Rome to answer a charge of heresy. His friends were filled with dread. They knew the danger that threatened him in that city. People remembered John Huss a century before, how he had been promised a safe passage and fair treatment, but he had been burned at the stake. Elector Frederick of Saxony, one of the seven German princes, demanded that the trial be held within the boundaries of his territory. The Pope's legate was to hear the trial on his behalf, but before the trial could begin, the legate was charged to prosecute and constrain without delay, and to banish, curse, and excommunicate all of whatever rank, in church or state, who would not seize Luther and his adherents. Here is displayed the true spirit of Luther's foes, not a trace of justice to be found. It was around this time that a dear friend of Luther would come to his aid and support, Philip Melanchthon. He was younger than Luther and was a learned scholar. His carefulness, gentleness and exactness would serve as a complement to Luther's courage and energy. Augsburg had been set as the place of the trial, and whilst Luther was told not to attend by many of his friends who feared for his life, he was resolute about attending and made his way to Augsburg. At this point, Luther had not received an assurance of a safe passage, and his foes hoped that he would appear without one, but this he refused to do. The legate was at first very friendly in his exchanges with Luther, but he misjudged his determination and the strength of his convictions. Luther protested that he was being asked to retract without first being shown his error. Every response that he gave, he showed clearly how it could be backed up with the Bible, but the legate's response was always a heated response with the words, retract, retract. Realizing that this exchange was futile, Luther asked to present his findings in writing, which he did the next day. He gave it to the legate and he threw them aside straight away. Luther then met this proud man on his own grounds, the traditions and teachings of the church, showing how his assumptions were wrong. The trial wasn't really going anywhere though, and Luther soon retreated with his friends. They had tried to bully Luther by their threats, but this had not worked. Luther's teachings and writings were spreading across Germany like wildfire, and eventually Rome resorted to a bull of excommunication. Luther was condemned along with his adherents, and they were given 60 days to either recant or be excommunicated. Normally, this would strike fear into the heart of anyone, but not Luther. He gathered around him a group of doctors, students, and citizens of Wittenberg, and under a tree near this very spot, he publicly burned the Pope's bull of excommunication and the canon laws. Rome produced another bull of excommunication against him, declaring his final separation from Rome, saying he was a curse of heaven and condemning anyone who adhere to any of his doctrines. Truly it can be said of Luther, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. While the forms of opposition to the truth change and how open they are over time, the same antagonism exists and will be manifested to God's people until the end of time. If you are being persecuted for the stands that you are holding and for the convictions that you have, I want to encourage you that no matter who you are, no matter where you are or what the situation is, stand boldly for God, stand courageously for God, no matter what the cost may be.